Uh, well, so <clears throat> I talked a little bit about how brokers are compensated. So let's just talk about how we're compensated because I'm proud of it. Um, I, um, we charge our clients the flat fee. And with most of our clients, so I liked getting bonuses. Like I liked getting a big check. Who doesn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't like what I had to do to get it when it was United or Blue Cross or Cigna giving it to me. So now we create bonus structures with our clients, mutually agreed upon bonus structures. And they can tie it to whatever metric they want, but the most common one that employers tie it to is lowering costs. And we've gotten some really big bonus checks, but it's only a little fraction of what we save the employer. So what kind of savings are we talking about? Now, for those of you that don't have P&L visibility in a company, I want you to understand that for most companies, this is like number two, three, four, or five on the P&L. Like this is next to payroll and maybe the cost of goods if you're a manufacturer, like this is the next biggest expense. So this is huge. Average, just ballpark numbers, the average employer is spending about 800,000 to a million dollars per hundred employees that they employ on the plan. Okay, so um, on average, we lower healthcare costs by 20 to 40% at the end of the first year, and typically another 10 to 20% at the end of the second year. And then uh, once we get all the excess out of the system, once we get employees going to higher quality providers and more transparent providers, once we have the right pharmacy benefit manager, and I want you to know too, we do other things on pharmacy like international importation of drugs or one of the things I love and I love turning this around on the drug companies but if if you guys I'm, I'm sure everyone has heard a drug commercial it's it's interesting there's only two countries in the world that even allow direct to consumer drug price commercials it's us and New Zealand um, but um, at the end of a drug commercial it says if you cannot afford your medication AstraZeneca maybe you'll help and they say it really fast and really low. And what they're advertising there is something called the Patients Assistance Program. Now, this came about back when Medicare Part D was signed into law under George Bush II, because uh, overnight, not only did the US become the largest buyer of drugs when we first gave drug coverage to seniors, but it's set in the law that we the price we pay, which is about four to five times more than what most other governments pay for drugs. And it dictated that in the pricing. But in order for them to get this gravy train, they had to agree that if someone doesn't have coverage for a drug and they meet certain income requirements, which are pretty reasonable, um, that they must be provided the drug at no cost by the manufacturer. Now, no coverage for a drug means the drug is not covered. What it doesn't mean is gosh, I have a $5,000 deductible and I only have $500 in my checking account, so I can't afford it. That You're still covered for that drug, so you wouldn't qualify for this program. Mm -hmm. Now, what we would do then is we would remove that drug from coverage and then walk the employee through the application process to get the drug mailed to them for free, free to them where they were paying $5,000 a year or whatever, and free to the health plan. Now, go ask Express Scripts to remove a drug from the formula, and they're going to say no because they get paid every time they fill a drug to the formula. So in our model, when we have PBMs that are paid in an aligned way, they have no trouble giving us that control. And I'm paid in an aligned way because I want to make that bonus. And I can make that bonus sometimes by just removing one high-cost drug. So again, back to that Upton Sinclair quote. Every vendor that we use to build out a health plan, and we, we use all the same components that every health plan has. There's an administrator, there's insurance for large claims, there's a pharmacy benefit manager, there's some way to price the care, there's medical management. All those things are still in there, but the players that we use, the way that they may get paid, the way that we get paid is aligned with the interest of the plan. And that just dramatically increases the likelihood of those outcomes actually occurring when everyone's paid to achieve those outcomes. So. I'm really proud when we get a bonus and I've never had a client not pay us. They're usually excited to pay us the bonus because we had some really big accomplishments for them. But I think for me, a lot of it is those clinical accomplishments where people have been dealing with chronic migraines and they've been going to the same doctor over and over and then we get them to a better doctor. One of the things that we really believe in is 
uh, enhancing primary care. Um, our healthcare system has intentionally devalued primary care to the point where most people skip over their primary care doctor and go right to the specialist they think they need. But like I said, with the back surgeon, the second you get to one of those doctors, they're in, their treatment is going most likely going to be whatever they specialize in. So if you go to a surgeon, the most like the treatment they're most likely to recommend is surgery. That's not what primary care was supposed to be. And here in the US, we actually spend a much lower percentage of our total spend on primary care than most other developed nations do. So it's, it's the people that have been dealing with multiple chronic conditions have been unable to cure them. They've just been treating the symptoms over and over. And I'll give you the number one drug that we substantially lower spend on is the number one drug in the US from a revenue perspective, which is Humira. And Humira is an anti-inflammatory. It's one of those biologic injectable drugs. Once you're on it, you can't take any other competitor. You're stuck with that one. Um, but the huge majority of people are needing these anti-inflammatory drugs because of what they're ingesting. Right. And when you get to a primary care doctor that can spend two or three hours with you, like my primary care doctor can, he finds, he uncovers so many other things, um, asks you about your nutrition, what's in your pantry, where do you shop culturally, you know, if you're Asian, there's different diets. So like the, the, the quality of care, and, and if I can get my primary care doctor to not just treat the symptoms, but cure the disease, that is the lowest cost environment to get cured, period. And they're incentivized to cure. They're not surgeons. They don't want to do surgery. And that's actually what I would define. It's not how our system works. It's not ours, but that is how healthcare should be defined, that you are trying to cure the disease and get positive outcomes. Um, and it's just sad that we're so far away from that, all the information that you've provided today. Um, I want to ask, um, you know, we have a lot of HR listeners, CEOs, mm -hmm. CFOs, and I just kind of want to reiterate the numbers and your pride in your bonus structure and how you get paid and the transparency behind that. You just asked, like you mentioned a couple ranges, which I quickly did math, not my strong suit, but I was able to do this one, um, 30 to 60% possible reduction in costs over a two year period. And so as a business leader, I've certainly had PL responsibility. And if somebody told me I can give you 60% <laughs> savings, what can you do? How can you reinvest in your business and your people and what kind of problems? I mean, we all get into a business because we're really passionate about it for the most part and want to do a good job and want to further the cause of what we're working on. And that kind of money is truly revolutionary. It can allow people to grow in ways that they may have not ever viewed possible, or at least certainly not in that time period. So I think it's a huge testament to what you guys are doing. A um, couple things to wrap up. What, what does being revolutionary mean to you, David? I think it, it for me, the revolution occurred when I was no longer being paid by the insurance carriers. And let me tell you the revolution that occurred. It's really simple. Prior to that, in my mind, there was a box of solutions that I pulled from all of which would pay me, right? I'm not going to work for free. I had employees and, you know, family to feed. So I had this box of solutions that this is what's going to pay me. This is the box I go to. Mm -hmm. When I got paid directly by the client and more importantly, aligned, that box completely went away. And how do I solve the problem? Because when I solve their problem, I make more money. And when I solve their problem, I do good for the world. Like I'm this, I think one of the things that brokers and consultants, it's been lost on them, maybe they never even had it, is I don't think there's another professional that a business employs that not only touches the company as deeply financially as we do, but touches every single employee and family member of that company financially. But more importantly, and I know most brokers take a hands-off approach and they put in Blue Cross and Blue Shield or United, but uh, they're also putting in processes that are driving clinical outcomes too. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge responsibility, especially when you look at statistics like the number one cause of bankruptcy in the US is medical bills and two thirds of those people had health insurance. That's an awful statistic. So I think... Again, a, there's a lot of really smart business owners. I want you to recognize you may not want to be, you may not have planned to be, you may not realize it, but you're in the healthcare business. When your third or fourth biggest expense is healthcare, you're in that business. And I remember I met with a really large national, international tire manufacturer. I won't say their name. And they told me when we walked in, 
about how they recently upgraded their trucks to have those uh, wings underneath the flatbed, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they said that it was saving them two cents a mile in gas. I said, really? You're saving two cents a mile in gas, that's fantastic. What are you doing to save two cents a dollar on your health plan? And the answer was nothing. So even though they spent millions and millions of dollars to save two cents a mile, they have no idea how to spend any money to save millions and millions and millions of dollars on healthcare. And I believe that if they looked, when I looked, when I peeled back the onion and I looked, that there, there's a lot of smarter people out there than I, and they are gonna find better ways to do it. They're gonna find ways that are more in line with their company's culture. And from an HR perspective, if you're HR, like this might sound, you probably don't fully understand it. I know we didn't go into enough to understand it. And so that lack of fully understanding it brings, oh my gosh, it's different. It's not gonna work, or maybe it's gonna be a lot of work. But think about this for a minute. Let's pretend that there's an employer out there who's paying 75% of the cost, which is a pretty common split. And they have high deductibles and high out-of-pockets. If I'm able to put in a plan where we eliminate those out-of-pockets when employees make, they have the choice, but they have the option to eliminate those out-of-pockets completely. And if at the same time, we cut the costs by 50%, that means the company can now pay 100% of the costs, still be paying less than they were paying before, and the HR person gets to say when they're hiring and recruiting, we pay 100% of healthcare and our plan often has no out of pockets. Like how amazing of an HR message is that? It's but incredible. it takes a couple of years to get there. It does. It's not easy. It's not, it's different. Um, but I just think it's, it's completely necessary. And I often find HR is our obstacle to doing this because they don't have P&L insight. They don't have a lot of financial education. That's not what they do. It's not what they went to school for. And so we demand from the get-go CEO or CFO involvement in the decision-making process. Once the decision is made, they can step aside and HR can take over. But this is a financial decision too. It's probably more a financial decision than an HR decision. And I think that that's been lost on, on it because you know HR, they, CFO says, HR, you handle it. And they're not given a lot of options. It's a Blue Cross United Signer Aetna. It's four options that most people get, and that's it. Yeah, and just as somebody newer to the industry, I'd say that the amount of knowledge that you need to learn um, moving into anything insurance related at all is, is truly astronomical. So I understand the challenge with HR. They are not insurance professionals. They aren't financial professionals. To your point, they don't have P&L. They're there to serve the employees, but they're going to rely heavily on the experts, which again, I'm using my air quotes, <laughs> the experts that they're working with. And so, you know, pick your resources wisely and ask the right questions. And if you're not liking the response, um, be willing to change. It can be tremendously, um, tremendously advantageous.